Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Surgery Live. Glad to have you here with us. So very uh, excited for today's topic and something that I think is very frustrating. Um, we're going to be talking about the surgical treatment of chronic pain after inguinal hernia repair, presented by Dr. David Kirpata and moderated by Dr. Clayton Petro. So, Dr. Petro, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to introduce my partner, David Kirpata. Uh, he helped build a multidisciplinary post-operative a groin pain clinic, um, and he's built a practice of seeing these patients, uh, which, like you said, I mean, these can be incredibly challenging cases. So uh, he's been at this for a couple years now and uh, has developed a lot of uh, uh, knowledge in this area. So I think uh, this will be pretty insightful. He's going to walk us through a case. So, uh, David, it's all yours. Thanks for having me. Um, this is actually a topic that I enjoy, which I realize that most of you on uh, Friday morning might uh, might not enjoy as much as I do. So I'm going to try and keep this light. Uh, I'm going to go through a case. I'm going to go through intro slides and then show you a video of the actual operation for the patient that we're going to present here. Okay, so uh, if there's really three takeaways that I could have you uh, go away with from this talk this morning, the first is that chronic groin pain after inguinal hernia repair is a real thing. Okay, so. Um, often these patients get dismissed, and that's one of the things that they, uh, when they present, is their biggest frustration is that nobody took them serious after uh, when they presented. So I, I think it's important that we do take this, these patients serious. Second is there are treatment options. Surgery is one of them, but there are medical, and I'll, I'll kind of go through some of these a little bit, things that you could do. And if you don't feel comfortable with them, sending them to somebody who maybe, who maybe could, can manage them. Uh, and then last and probably most important is that I, I actually really do enjoy this. So I'm happy to help in any way that I can. You can email me, call me, you can send the patients to me. I'm more than happy to uh, see them all. We actually have a clinic here that's dedicated to the treatment of patients with chronic groin pain after inguinal hernia surgery. It's a multidisciplinary clinic that uh, patients come from all over the country to be a part of. So uh, I'm happy to help any way that I can. And let me tell you, there are actually quite a few patients because in the US, we repair about 750,000 inguinal hernias annually. And depending on how you define chronic groin pain, it's estimated that about 15% of patients will have chronic groin pain one year after surgery. And that is defined as having either pain that impacts their ability to concentrate on a daily basis or impact their activity. That doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is seeking medical attention and, and wants something done. But it's about 3% of people that are actually seeking medical attention, which is about almost 25,000 patients annually. Now, if you consider that about 50,000 people are going to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the U.S. this year, and there are multidisciplinary clinics across the entire uh, globe for these patients, and there are really not any for chronic groin pain, this is a, a, a significantly underserved population that I think we can actually help. So let's just go right into the case and kind of talk about... Um, this individual. So this is a patient I saw eight months after their initial operation, which was a bilateral robotic inguinal hernia repair. Okay. Prior to surgery, they had a reducible left inguinal bulge and they had a bilateral repair because on uh, during the operation, they were noted to have a contralateral hernia, although nothing was symptomatic prior to surgery. The patient had a typical course after surgery. They felt like they had pain for about the first two weeks that they expected after surgery. But then after six weeks when all restrictions were taken off and they tried to resume their activity, which included swimming, hiking, et cetera, they felt debilitated. 10 out of 10 pain, all mechanical in nature. And just fortunately for this person, the, the operation was actually done during the pandemic. And they felt like if they had to actually drive to work every day, they would not have been able to continue working. So working from home was actually beneficial for this patient. Past medical history, just uh, lupus, factor V Leiden deficiency currently on uh, uh, Zeralto for DVTs, and a past surgical history of a left hip replacement, as well as an appendectomy. On their physical exam, when I saw them, they had an umbilical hernia. There was no evidence of a recurrent inguinal hernia. They were tender to deep palpation over the bilateral inguinal canals. And they had normal gait when they walked into the clinic and walked out of the clinic, but it was very obvious that they were positionally impacted by their pain, meaning that they would actually not sit straight up uh, in a chair and they would slouch back. And this is actually not an uncommon finding that people will try and keep themselves in a, in a sort of erect position so that they're not bending uh, at the waist. So I'm gonna kind of go to the audience here. 
And let's see, I think uh, Jonah Thomas is one of our medical students. I'm going to give him an opportunity to say what he would actually do next for this patient. Um, so, we, so we've already evaluated this person in clinic in terms of a physical exam. Or are we just seeing them for the first time? Yep. So you're seeing them. That was their physical exam. And what would you like to do? Uh, so I, I think really the first steps I would choose would be uh, really physical therapy potentially, um, dynamic ultrasound, and then uh, based on those findings, uh, we could consider surgery after that. And so, what are you looking for with your dynamic ultrasound? Uh, so I'm looking for the actual presence of uh, potentially a recurrence um, of a hernia. Okay, so I think that's the high point is some type of imaging uh, to see if there there is a recurrence. I think that's the most important thing to rule out out of the gate. So actually, this patient before they saw me, uh, they got a CT scan. That was the first imaging that was obtained. I'm going to actually go through this as this, as this really happened for this patient. So the CT scan really didn't demonstrate any significant findings, although I will point out on this scan that you can actually see the patient's uh, mesh in this, in this image. So I'm gonna point it out with the pointer here. So this is actually his mesh and you can see it's folded in. Now I consider this somewhat of a significant finding because this actually points directly into the internal ring. It almost in a sense, as I describe it as a reverse plug. So this is a notable finding to me, okay? So, uh, so in terms of things that I like to do next for patients in these situations, and I think it's probably the most important thing to do is to review their operative records. And I'm highlighting this because it's something that we don't commonly do, uh, but you want to know about the mesh that somebody had. Okay, so in this circumstance, there was a laparoscopic repair, maybe less important, but if somebody's coming in for an open angle or hernia repair, if they had a plug or a proline hernia system, that is something I'm gonna to wanna to know beforehand because that may expedite how I treat them in terms of going to surgery or trying some other therapies, okay? So Clayton, what would you do uh, next for this patient after you review the operative reports? Yeah, so I think if I have them in the, in the uh, office at that point, I would probably do some dermatomal mapping. Um, and uh, at that point, I would probably offer them depending on what the mapping looked like, uh, you know, if it's something that I feel like is very localized, I may try an injection versus uh, if it's more just diffuse generalized pain, I may go the physical therapy route. Okay, so so people may not be familiar with what dermatomal mapping is. Let me just kind of stop for a second and point this out. So this is actually something we very commonly do in the groin pain clinic. And if you're really going to get intense with this, uh, with dermatomal mapping, you should be doing uh, temperature, pinprick, as well as optometry, which is pressure sensation. Uh, and you would do that along the entire lower quadrant, upper thigh of the patient, trying to identify a specific nerve that might be involved. Now, that's a lot to do and it requires additional equipment. So what we do in the clinic is actually just take, take a skin marker and gently press on their skin in all the in the lower quadrants and up on the anterior thigh. And I asked the patient, on a, I'm gonna to touch with the tip of the pen, I wanna know one of three things. Does it feel normal? Do you feel pain or do you feel numbness? Okay. And then what you'll end up with with a map and you wanna see if this ends up looking something like your dermatomal map. And that might indicate to you that this is actually a specific nerve injury that I can target. Okay, so this is actually this patient's dermatomal mapping they had pain directly over the inguinal canal, but I wouldn't say that this really was significant in terms of identifying a specific nerve. Now, this does take a little bit of time to kind of get comfortable with in terms of doing for patients, because you'll you'll recognize when somebody has real pain that's from from a nerve, because you either touch them with the tip of the pen, and it'll it'll send a shooting uh, pain down the nerve, and they'll they'll like kind of jump and be like, oh, what was that? And that's a pain that they weren't expecting as opposed to sometimes you push and say, oh yeah, I have pain in that area, which is not really what you wanna know. You wanna know exactly what happens when the tip of the pen hits the skin. The other finding that will surprise people is if you go along their dermatome, but you go further up the nerve away from where the mesh is or away from where the repair is and, they have, and they'll have pain in that area, that will surprise them. And they're like, oh, I've never had pain over there. But it starts in that dermatome, that is usually an indicator that yeah, you're hitting the nerve, you're finding uh, a nerve injury. 
So we nerve tone mapped this gentleman, and this is what we found. And again, I would not consider this a specific nerve type injury. Hey, David. David so I think David, Clayton said that answered that. Yep. Can I, this is Rosa. Can I, real quick, can I just ask you one thing just to back up for a second? Because you, the operative notes. I'm just curious, just yep. for a lot of people on the call, when you describe the operation, they repaired an asymptomatic hernia that they found during surgery on the contralateral side, which when I was a fellow, we were trained to do that. Is that, I mean, in your world, what, what do you think the current recommendation of that is now? Okay, so um, so first off, in terms of their operative record, they didn't describe specifically, they said that they noted a hernia over there, didn't, uh, didn't really talk about the patient having any symptoms beforehand. In my opinion, Especially if this is somebody with a, a normal body habitus where you should expect to feel an exam on hernia if it's actually there. If I find something that's really small and they were asymptomatic beforehand, I do not fix those. Uh, I'm biased in the fact that I see a lot of patients with chronic groin pain. And so I see the, the negative consequences of an inguinal hernia repair. And so for the fact that those rates of chronic groin pain can be up to 15% and, and cause people discomfort in one year, I can't make something that's asymptomatic any better than it already is. With the caveat that if I'm doing somebody who's morbidly obese that I don't feel like I had a really great exam on them and they have a significant inguinal hernia, that is probably somebody I would consider repairing a contralateral hernia that was identified during the operation. Does that answer your question? Yep, yep, thanks. Yep. Okay. So I think Clayton said the next thing he would do is uh, try physical therapy. So let's just jump into this is surgery live. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the non-surgical stuff, but I think it's important to highlight a few things. Medications can be beneficial for patients who have chronic pain, but if you're doing ibuprofen, Tylenol, and opioids for longer than three months after somebody's initial operation, that's usually an indication that they need to elevate their treatment uh, and, and start looking at reasons for their pain, uh, because that is sort of abnormal at this point. Gabapentin is probably the most common medication that people will initially go to. However, it's usually extremely uh, underutilized in terms of appropriateness. Gabapentin is a medication that has to be titrated to effect, and you're going to get one of two effects. You're either going to get the effect of improvement in their pain, or you're going to reach side effects. Because the, because the side effect profile for gabapentin is so nasty, um, you want to start low, and that can be as low as 100 milligrams three times a day. Most commonly, if somebody can, is of a, a normal age and renal function, uh, you're going to start at 300 milligrams three times a day. And you want to give them you know, at least four weeks to kind of elevate their levels in their blood before you make adjustments. And then if they're not having any effect, but they're also not having side effects, you can go up on it. You can go up to 900 milligrams three times a day at a max dose for gabapentin. But most people get an inadequate trial of gabapentin. Uh, there are other medications, and, and it's actually increasingly common that people will be placed on antidepressants, specifically Cymbalta, as an adjunct for chronic pain. There's some good literature that supports its use. It is not a medication that I specifically uh, prescribe, uh, but it is an indication, I think, to send somebody to somebody uh, to chronic pain uh, management so that they can get that. So it's always better when you send somebody to chronic pain with a goal and say, oh, I want to talk about these medications or this therapy as opposed to just saying, hey, just go see chronic pain. Uh, physical therapy, I don't necessarily do physical therapy for everyone. I think if you find uh, musculoskeletal findings on the MRI or your dynamic ultrasound, it is definitely worth trying physical therapy. The worst you would lose is a three month trial of time, um, but there are certain indications, certain indications for an operation that I would not necessarily skip the process. And, you know, I would go straight to surgery if somebody had pain and it was mechanical and it was a plug. And I think if you have mechanical pain and you send somebody to physical therapy for three months, you're somewhat torturing them uh, if you really think it's the plug. So, I, you know, those people, I usually skip physical therapy. Uh, in terms of injections, which I think was mentioned, I have not found injections to be very uh, therapeutic in the long term, but I think they're very helpful in terms of being diagnostic or providing a short term therapy for patients. And for that reason, I usually recommend that people have image guided uh, injections. And the reason for this is that I would rather have, rather than me do, doing landmarks and not knowing exactly where I am, I would rather have them take the ultrasound, put the needle next to the nerve, and inject a low volume of an anesthetic 
one to three cc's right next to the nerve and see if you get an, uh, in, uh, any response. If you get a response, then you have an indication for uh, potentially selective neurectomy. A lot of times people will get an injection, it'll be 20 cc's of an anesthetic into the groin and you're just numbing up the entire groin in all the planes. And I'm not sure that that's really as sort of diagnostic uh, in terms of what you should do next. Okay, so that leaves us with kind of three options. You can either operate on this patient now, you can send them to pain management, or you can run away. So let's go to, uh, is uh, Manny Lomenzo on? I am. Uh, thanks for taking the lead in this very difficult patient population. Um, so, like you said, if you have uh, somewhat of a mass effect from a mesh, you don't have a specific nerve distribution. Uh, I think, uh, and you failed all the other non-operative interventions. I think the next uh, step is to remove the mesh. Um, of course, the questions will be the approach, number one, and number two, what to do recurrently, uh, recurrent turning at that point, if you address it here or later on. And third, whether you're going to add uh, neurectomy since you're going to be there and want to really eliminate every possible cause of pain in somebody that has already been uh, cr chronically suffering from this. And then if I may, a quick question, I don't know if you, uh, I'm going to mention at some point, uh, how is the timing of onset of pain uh, playing a role in your decision making? Thank you again. Okay, all, all good points and questions. Um, so, in terms of onset, I'll just jump right to that. So, I always ask people about the pain that they had before their initial hernia operation because I want to know what uh, symptoms they might have been experiencing. Because a lot of times people can come in and they actually have primary pain from a different from a source outside of the groin. You know, this patient in particular had a left. Uh, hip replacement. So in that person, if they had pain before surgery, uh, I would always send them to an orthopedist to make sure that, th that their hip is okay. Um, in terms of after their surgery, timing wise, if somebody develops pain, they sort of heal up and then you develop six pains. Like this was pretty classic for somebody having more of an issue with the mesh and the way it's healed into place. Um, if somebody, you know, fits within you know, this three scenarios, somebody wakes up with pain, from their operation and it never goes away. Those people almost always will get some sort of an intervention. There's people who develop pain within the first six months. And the, the thought there is that some of that is tends to be what we call nociceptive pain related to the scarring and the mesh placement. Uh, and those people will most commonly refer uh, or um, respond to a treatment. But as soon as you get to people who are having pain that may have started a year after surgery, you have to start wondering if, if it really is related to the hernia repair. And then in those patients, I'm going to exhaust all other options and look for other primary diagnoses, like make sure they get a back evaluation, make sure they get a hip evaluation before I consider um, operating on them. Even if I think, yeah, this may be related to the mesh. Um, so I'm going to address some of the other questions that you had too, in terms of what to do during the operation. But that is in fact, what this gentleman had. And this is actually before he saw me, he saw another surgeon who went in in a diagnostic laparoscopy, and these are the images from the case. That is the mesh on the left side, which is where he was primarily having pain, and that was just left alone. On the right side, they actually removed about 25% of the lateral portion of the right mesh. Okay, so that was his initial uh, attempt at a surgery for this. And unfortunately, after this operation, he did not have any improvement in his pain. So this is actually what he saw me was after that. Uh, and kind of, we uh, mentioned this before, dynamic ultrasound. This is actually my go-to for imaging. It's not available for everybody. I work with the musculoskeletal radiologist here uh, pretty closely so that they know what I'm looking for, but it really allows you to evaluate for recurrence. It allows you to look at the core and see if there's any relationship to the musculoskeletal system. And allows you to actually specifically look at the nerves. And they'll look for nerves, they'll look for neuritis, enlargement, scarring at the edges of the mesh. It can all be seen with a dynamic ultrasound. So it's very helpful. In this case, the patient had dynamic ultrasound and it was completely normal, okay? So just to sort of recap my decision-making, we talked about the history of pain prior to surgery. This patient's pain is primarily mechanical 
and non-neuropathic. So in that sense, in terms of deciding whether or not to do an erectomy on a patient in addition, this is somebody I'm concerned more about this probably the, the hernia repair itself. And I think that the mesh removal is probably the most important. If somebody has orchalgia, testicular pain that's related to it, if I'm doing this operation, I may do a general femoral nerectomy at the same time. Uh, he doesn't have a recurrence. That's also a good indicator that, uh, that maybe this is related to the repair. Um, his dermatomal mapping clearly is not suggestive of a specific nerve, and he didn't have any response to an injection. So other reasons why I would not do a nerectomy uh, in some patients. And, and again, he failed non-surgical uh, approaches. So at this point, uh, I felt, felt the most appropriate thing was to uh, take out his mesh. So I performed bilateral laparoscopic ingual mesh removals on him. And something I learned in fellowship is that you should always have a very clear goal on kind of steps in the way you want to do an operation. This is not a common operation. And even when I started doing these, I wouldn't say that I went in with really defined steps, but I feel like I've developed them over time. And these are the six things, and this is the kind of the way that I approach a mesh removal. The first is I usually want to dissect it, dissect into the space of resinus. I'm going to leave the mesh up on the abdominal wall. So it's currently retracted, and I'm going to start to create that space. And then I'm going to free the lateral flap of the mesh and then expose the superior border of the mesh and bring it all the way back over to the medial edge. And I'm going to show the video and you kind of go through these steps here. So then I'm going to identify the gnata vessels. Uh, and try and preserve them. And then all this is kind of working towards toning in on the inferior epigastrics. And then I'm going to create what would I describe as sort of a critical view for these mesh removals. Um, and I'll highlight that in the video. And then the last thing is if you can do that, then you can kind of safely take the mesh off the remaining inferior epigastrics and the iliacs if they're attached, uh, and then off a of tuber's ligament, and then you're finally mesh is going to be removed. So here's the video. Uh, hopefully it's going to play for everybody. So when we first went in, it was initially some adhesions to his, um, actually first his flap, uh, which we took down. And this is, I like to get the bottom of the, the mesh exposed so I know the extent of where the mesh is. And here I'm kind of highlighting that this is actually that bulky kind of folded up part that we saw in the, uh, in the CT scan. So first I'm going to get into the space of Retsius. Now this is not ever sort of a pretty operation. It requires uh, cautery, it requires blunt dissection, it requires sharp dissection. Uh, and it is tedious, but I'm going into the space of rest because I'm actually getting to the to the medial portion of the mesh. You can see this is the mesh and the edge. I want to find normal anatomy. Okay, then I'm going to take this lateral and just free up as much of the space of rest as I can. Because if I can get everything exposed in on the lateral wall of the uh, pubis, then I can I know where the iliac vein is, which is my biggest concern. So now I'm going to identify the lateral edge of the mesh, and I'm going to start to retract that back. And the goal here is actually, this is where you're really gonna start taking the mesh down. And this is probably your safest place to start working towards the inferior epigastric vessels. But once we get the, the lateral flap, we're gonna take this all the way across the superior edge. Okay, and then I'm gonna try and connect this over all the way to the medial portion of the mesh. And then we'll start taking it down. And the reason why I do this is that I wanna get the entire front open to the mesh so that I know where the inferior epigastric vessels are. Because those are the that's I'm always concerned mostly about vascular injury during this. That's that's my biggest uh, uh, concern. So once I've actually freed up the mesh, now I can start to take it off the abdominal wall. And I, this is I use mostly cautery uh, to get it uh, all this. And, and this is really I always tell the fellow this is about creating this operation three dimensionally in your head, understanding where the anatomy is. For all this, and, and when you do this a lot, it becomes a little bit easier. But you can see that we have the inferior epigastric vessels here. I'm, I'm kind of dividing uh, and separating both sides of it, medial and lateral, and then coning in on the vessels themselves. I typically try and preserve the vessels as best as I can. Sometimes you can't, uh, and I think that that's that's perfectly fine. You got to do whatever's safest for the patient. Uh, but if I can preserve them, uh, I will. So we're carefully dissecting the inferior epigastrics uh, off of the mesh. And we have an assist port in here who's putting counter traction. So now uh, laterally, I'm identifying the gonadal vessels. Uh, and you can see that they're actually pretty stuck on the, on the mesh itself. Again, I, I'm going to try and preserve these, but I, before the operation, I'm going to have a discussion with every patient that they may lose a testicle during this operation. That is a real possibility. Okay. And I also tell you that if you have to take these vessels here, 
it doesn't automatically mean that you need to remove the testicle itself. There is collateral flow. And um, I've actually been in the case where, you know, I was concerned about this at the beginning. So I would have the urologist come in and they were like, no, it's, there's enough flow. You, you know, we'll see how it does afterwards. If they develop significant pain afterwards, yes, you may need to go back to the operating room and take out the testicle. But most people, even if you injured that uh, uh, supply, they'd be okay. So here we're getting into this, what I'm just trying to critical view here. So we have the gonadal vessels taken off. We have the vast deference over here. And then here is where the iliac vein is. So sometimes the mesh is uh, heavily attached, but not always. And then here are the inferior epigastrics. And so this is the view that I want to see so that if I need to take the inferior epigastrics before they go into the iliacs, I have that access. So now this is always where the, where the mesh is going to be the most stuck on the inferior epigastrics. I'm going to take this off. And I'm going to get, get after it and see if I can do it. If I can't, I have these vessels readily available to be clipped. And if I need to do that, I'll do it. So now it's off the inferior epigastrics. And this is sort of the final steps uh, in removing it. So this is the final product. We were able to preserve everything, inferior epigastrics, uh, vas deferens, uh, and gonadals. Uh, and then we went on and did the, did the right side as well. But I'm not going to show that portion of it. So this portion, I watch everybody for a day after surgery with this, with this dissection just because um, of, of my concern about vascular injury. I've had to take people back for bleeding. I've been inside the iliac vein when doing these before. Uh, it, it, it is uh, a nerve-wracking operation, at least at least my opinion. Uh, and I watch people for bleeding reasons after surgery. This uh, gentleman was discharged on post operative one. He had a significant improvement in his pain. He went to a one out of 10, and he's actually resumed a lot of his activities two months after surgery, including swimming, uh, and long walks up to five miles that he was not able to do uh, after his initial repair. Although I'm not going to say that he's perfect. He still has some discomfort. We'll see if that all resolves. And I think you have to set expectations with people. One thing we've learned looking at uh, the results of pain is that a lot of people will get significant improvement. But improvement doesn't always mean you're going to get to no pain. So I always have that conversation with people up front uh, as well. So I think we have uh, a little bit of time for some questions, but thank you. Uh, for paying attention and uh, happy to answer any questions. David, that was a great talk. Um, talk real quick about um, you know the counseling people over putting a new piece of mesh in and their likelihood of hernia recurrence. Okay, good question. So you know what's interesting is that a lot of times you go in, now you saw the final product there. I don't think anybody saw a hernia uh, when when we took that mesh out. And I'm not sure if it's just a result of the scar that was left during the operation, but you usually do not see an obvious hernia. If they have an obvious hernia, I tell them I'm going to do an open repair and I'm going to do a uh, I'm going to do a tissue based repair, because most of these people do not want new mesh back in. I'll have that conversation with them up front. If somebody wants mesh back in, I will place it back in. But the majority you will find are just for whatever reason, do not want another foreign material. They they typically view it as the cause of the pain, which it may or may not be. Um, but if they have a recurrence, I usually fix it open with a primary tissue repair and, and explain to them that, that the risk of recurrence is higher with that repair. And uh, there's a question about who all makes out uh, your multidisciplinary team. So maybe talk a little about that and uh, some guidance for folks of when to refer. Do they refer three months, six months? You know, if they're seeing their own patients back for chronic pain and they wanted to get them into a to see you. Yeah, so uh, so the multidisciplinary clinic, the way it works is when so, uh, somebody comes in, the idea is that they're going to come in and get all their care and the decision made at the end of it uh, after a three hour visit. So they come in, they spend three hours with us, they see me, they have an evaluation with our uh, pain management, pain psychologist. Um, and then they have a, a dynamic ultrasound. So if we feel like they need additional things like to see an orthopedist, unfortunately, I don't have an orthopedist uh, in the clinic, um, but we can refer them to them and, and that's not uncommon. But most of the time we can come up with a good game plan that initiates a therapy, can be surgery or non-surgical uh, with that three hour visit. Uh, in terms of who to refer, I think anybody you're concerned about, uh, you know, if they're having pain after three months and it just seems abnormal and you don't feel comfortable with um, with you know, kind of proceeding with their own, with their management, they should be sent on early because the earlier you intervene, the better uh, likelihood that they are going to have an improvement with any sort of interventions. So certainly if somebody's having pain that's six months after surgery, it's been persistent, 
they should have an evaluation. So if you're seeing them six months and, and you can't do anything, definitely send them by that point. Okay, and then lastly, I think just, just so we hit all the questions, um, uh, on the mapping, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, dermatome, does that lead you in any special direction? Uh, yeah, so um, I've seen people with, uh, the, actually the most common time I see people with lateral femoral cutaneous injuries is usually when they've had an attempted uh, triple nerectomy uh, and they, they've sort of, the, the lateral femoral cutaneous has been misidentified as the ileal inguinal nerve. And when I map them out, they're numb along the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So the lateral thigh, uh, always consider that as part of your mapping out when you do your term, dermatomal mapping. I would say that if you have a lateral femoral injury, it is usually going to be from attack. It's going to be showing up in the in the um, uh, recovery area, and that is an indication to take somebody back to surgery immediately to remove that attack. So, if somebody's having pain on the lateral thigh, it's lateral femoral uh, and they haven't been treated, that is somebody I would just go directly after that nerve, either removing uh, attack that's in there. And if I remove tax, I usually do an erectomy with it because the scarring can be bad enough that they're that they're probably still going to have some residual pain if you don't do an erectomy. But understanding that when you do that, you're expecting it to be numb, and you have to tell patients that up front. All right, excellent. I think that uh, wraps it up. That was a great talk, great summary. Uh, Dr. Rosen, anything else? Yeah, thanks so much the, for thanks for a great talk, Dr. Karpata, and for moderating, Dr. Petro. Much appreciated. Uh, in terms of uh, our monthly reminder, we meet every Friday except the first Friday, rotate through the general surgery subspecialties. Uh, we will be right back here next week um, with uh, Dr. Aminian. We'll be moderating a topic called sleeve gastrectomy and the difficult abdomen uh, with Dr. Ghanem out of Mayo Clinic. So. Uh, thanks as usual to Medtronic for sponsoring and thanks to you all for being here, uh, participating in the discussion and making it a great session. We'll see you next time on Surgery Live.